Hello, everybody. We're going to give everyone a few seconds to get into the room, everyone that's here tonight. So just hang tight and wait until it looks like people are all in and ready to go. Good evening. Hi, everyone. We're just waiting for all the folks to join the room. So just bear with us for a few seconds as we get going. All right, I think it looks like everyone's coming in. That was at least waiting, but I anticipate we'll have some more folks join us. Good evening, my name is Michelle Bird. I'm the Public Affairs Director here at Larimer County. Um, thank you for joining us um, to talk about the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. Um, I'm really quickly, before I talk about how you guys can participate tonight, I am going to allow the other panelists to introduce themselves. So um, I, let's start with Shale. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Shale Sabo. I am a emergency management coordinator with the Larimer County Office of Emergency Management, and I've been the project lead on the county side of things for the hazard mitigation plan update. Longest title ever. <laughs> <laughs> Get that all on a business card. Thank you, Shale. Scott, you're up. Hi, I'm Scott Field. I'm a Senior Emergency Management Coordinator with uh, Wood Environment and Infrastructure. We're a consultant group uh, out of Denver, and I'm the, uh, project, the, the project manager for the consultant team that's assisting with this update, and I'm the one whose voice you're going to listen to droning on for about the next hour. So awesome. I apologize in advance. <laughs> that's okay, Scott. Someone's got to be the one. And it looks like Amy Carr has joined us. Amy, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to our attendees tonight? Hi, everyone. My name is Amy. I'm a hazard mitigation planner on the wood planning team. Thanks for joining us tonight. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. So for all of our attendees, just a little brief um, agenda for the evening. First, I'm going to talk to you guys about how you can participate. Then we're going to watch about a 45 minute video. Um, we do the video so that we can add closed captions to it in case we have anyone joining us who um, needs the, the captions to participate. So we'll watch a video that's led by Scott. Uh, it's basically the same presentation he would have given live. Um, and then after the video is over, what we'll do is we'll do a Q&A session. Um, feel free to participate in the Q&A as the video is going so you don't forget your questions as we're going. So you might be asking at this point, how do I ask a question? Um, Zoom webinar is a little bit different than probably what you're used to with, with other Zoom meetings. You'll notice that there's no chat box for you. Um, however, there is that Q&A box. So as you have questions or if you have comments that come up as we're watching the presentation or later on while we're doing Q&A, go ahead and just type your questions or comments into the Q&A um, box. I do see we have a caller listening in. Um, so for that caller, if they want to ask questions later, so I'm looking for my cheat sheet. What they need to do is press star nine um, to let us know that they are interested in asking us a question. So you don't necessarily have to have the Zoom app in order to participate tonight. For our caller, you can, you can hit star nine and, and you can ask your question. However, we're not going to do questions till the end. We're going to go through the whole presentation first, save those questions till the end. Um, I know some folks like to kind of just have a running commentary as um, they're participating in these things and so they really miss the chat box for that reason. And one of the reasons we don't have a chat box is it's for safety basically for you guys and for us, but primarily for you guys. Since this is a public meeting and we invite everybody to join us, we don't necessarily know who it is that's joining us. Um, when there's a chat box, what can happen is someone can come in, send out a link to a page that'll put ransomware um, on your computer or maybe take you to a site you don't want to go to. So we're really trying to prevent that type of digital interaction. Um, however, feel free to put comments in the Q&A and I'll just make them live. Really, what the Q&A does, it gives me an opportunity to make sure there's not some link in there that goes somewhere bad. Um, and then I'll make it live. So we're not trying to stifle anyone's voice, anything like that. It's really a safety precaution. Same thing for the videos. As you can notice, you can see the, us, the panelists, but we can't see you. Um, or you can't see the other attendees. Again, that's because everyone is welcome, um, but we don't know what people are gonna put on their video screen. Um, and so that can, that can be a little unnerving at times, um, and we just wanna make sure everyone's protected. 
So with that, and if I don't have anything else from my other panelists, I think, should we start the video, Scott? Roll them. Awesome. Okay, so folks, bear with me as I share my screen. And then I'm going to make this bigger. And Shale, please jump in if you can't hear the video right away. Let me turn the volume up. And let's go. Good evening. Welcome to our second public meeting. 2020 update of the Larimer County multi jurisdiction It's really, really faint. Of those of you Hold on. First public meeting. Let's see. I have, let me turn my volume on my computer all the way up and see if that helps. Meeting back in May. Oh, thank you for coming back. Uh, Did that help at all, better. Shale? Awesome. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to mute myself and turn off my video and we will get Introducing uh, myself and the team here in a minute, and then we're going to go uh, through an overview of what hazard mitigation planning is, what we're doing uh, here, and why it's important. We're going to go over the results of uh, a survey that we did to get public opinion on hazards in Larimer County. Uh, and then I'm going to give an overview of the mitigation plan in question and, and uh, give you a sense of, of what's in it uh, as an overview. And then we'll dive down into a few key sections of the plan, give you a sense of the type of material and information that's contained in the plan. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what the uh, the next steps and how you can continue to participate in and provide your input into the process. Uh, and then once I'm done talking, we'll have uh, um, going to open up for your questions and discussion and any feedback you might have. Uh, as I said, my name is Scott Field. Uh, I'm a consultant with uh, Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions down in Denver, and I'm the, the head of the consultant team uh, that the county has hired to help with this uh, update process. I'm joined by my colleague Amy Carr, uh, and then also with us today from the county are Shale Sabo with the Office of Emergency Management and Michelle Bird with uh, the County Public Affairs Office. And we also have representatives from some of the municipalities uh, on tonight, and uh, we'll introduce uh, or let them introduce themselves when we get to the question and answer uh, portion. So what is hazard mitigation planning and why is it important? Well, let's start off with some terms that we're going to be using throughout this. So uh, when I say a hazard, what we mean by that is anything that can cause damage to the community, uh, to people and property. So it could be a natural hazard like a flood or a wildfire or a tornado, or it could be something human caused like a hazardous material spill or even a an act of terrorism. Uh, when it, vulnerability uh, is a term we use to refer to how the community can be affected by that hazard. Uh, so for example, uh, if we have uh, a flood in an area that there's no buildings and no people, we're, uh, that's going to do less damage and we're not as concerned about that as we are a flood in an area where buildings are going to flood and people's lives are going to be placed at risk. So that overlap between those two, that red area in the middle where hazards overlap with community vulnerabilities, that's what we call risk. Um, and that's the part that we're worried about. And the term mitigation we use in this context is used actions we're taking before a disaster to lower risk. You know, we can't always prevent natural hazards. You know, we can't stop winter storms. Uh, we, we, we can't prevent a lot of these things from happening, but what we can do is reduce their impacts. The goal is we want to shrink that red area, that, that risk area there in the middle. Uh, well, why is it important to do this? Well, if you if you watch the news and you've been paying attention, you, you may have a sense that we're having more disasters, more frequent disasters and more expensive disasters. Uh, and that actually is the case. That's uh, that's uh, backed up by the by data. This chart comes from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and it just shows the number of uh, of billion dollar disasters every year. And as you can see, just 40 years ago, that they were fairly infrequent. You know, we'd have just a couple a year. Now they're they're really common and they're getting much, much more expensive. You can also see the black line shows the dollar amounts. Uh, the disasters are becoming, we're spending far more money on disaster response and recovery every year. There's several reasons behind that. Partly is just more people uh, and with growth comes growth in hazardous areas. You know, we have more people building in floodplains, more people building in, uh, 
uh, wild or um, uh, forested areas that are at risk of wildfire and so forth. Um, additionally, the cost of infrastructure keeps going up, partly due to lack of building or to um, uh, more expensive building materials, partly just because we're building stuff better. But then when it does get damaged, it costs more to repair and, and, re and replace stuff. Uh, also, we do uh, definitely seem like we're seeing more more frequent uh, severe weather events and more severe severe weather events. Um, so when you have all of these uh, combined together, you get sort of this cascading effect where one disaster can lead to other disasters. And kind of the, the classic example is you have a drought for a few years, so everything dries out. So then that uh, you're more likely to have a fire, and that fire is more likely to burn more severely because everything's so dry. And then once that's happened, now you have a burn scar, and that increases your flood vulnerability. So we're seeing more and more this kind of cascading effect of hazards. So obviously, uh, it's it's very important for state and local governments to address this trend. Uh, certainly, governments have a, a a moral and a legal responsibility to protect uh, uh, lives and and property in their jurisdictions. But it, there's also just a financial uh, cost or a financial case for doing so because, frankly, as I said, we're just we're spending so much responding to these disasters. We can't keep doing this. The cost of, of not doing anything about this is is too expensive. Uh, a lot of these events are. To a certain degree predictable you know we, we have a general good idea of how often areas flood we have a general sense of where they're most likely to flood uh, and there are things we can do to reduce the impacts of those uh, there are actions that have been proven to work uh, that are relatively um, inexpensive and very cost effective uh, they're good for the environment and there is funding available to help with those you know basically there's there's this perception sometimes of or this, this feeling like you know we have a disaster and then we rebuild and we have another disaster you know it's like the old Monty Python skit of you know I built the castle and it sank into the swamp so I built another castle it sank into the swamp too so I built a third castle we want to avoid we want to break that cycle the idea here is is um, when we do rebuild we want to rebuild stronger and better so that it's not going to sink into the swamp next time there have been a number of studies that have been done this most recent ones from 2017 showing that um, that these uh, these type of actions we're talking about are very very cost effective. Uh, this study found that for every dollar we spend on hazard mitigation, saves us on an, on average six dollars in response costs. And you can see the the ratio varies from different types of projects. Uh, uh, it's a little less cost effective for things like wildfire mitigation because uh, things like uh, fuels reduction has to be redone every few years, but even so you're still uh, saving three dollars for every dollar you spend. I think most folks, if I told you you could spend a dollar today to save six dollars tomorrow, most people would take that. Uh, so there's a, a it makes good financial sense to do this as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there are funds available to, to help uh, with this. In addition to just, uh, you know, capital improvement funds and general fund budgets, there's a number of grant opportunities from uh, the state and federal governments. Uh, primarily FEMA in particular has a number of, of hazard mitigation assistance programs. Uh, and one of the other reasons why we're updating this plan now uh, is that in order to be eligible for those grants, you have to have an approved, uh, a FEMA approved mitigation plan. Uh, the picture here is the cover of the, uh, the uh, county's current mitigation plan, which went into effect in uh, 2016. And uh, it is a FEMA requirement that they be updated every five years, which is why we're in the process of, of updating this now with new information um, to uh, keep uh, eligibility for those grant funds. I, I keep ref I refer to the county a lot, and I'm going to do that uh, throughout this presentation uh, as far as you know that this plan covers all of Larimer County, but it is what we call a multi jurisdictional plan, which means it, it, it includes not just the county government itself, but all the uh, incorporated municipalities. And as you can see, there's a number of fire districts and special districts, uh, Estes Park Health, uh, sanitation districts, and other things that have uh, joined in this effort to uh, uh, help reduce. Uh, losses from disasters across Larimer County and in their jurisdictions and and uh, save uh, uh, save response costs down the road. So there's a four phase process we've been following and uh, those of you who attended the first public meeting, we went uh, into, into this a lot more detail. This is the sh I'll just give you the short version tonight, but uh, basically the first phase is kind of getting organized, sort of the getting the band back together stage where we uh, um, uh, get the jurisdictions together and representatives all together and talk about how we're going to uh, uh, 
build this process this year and how we're going to involve the public and other important things. Uh, the second phase is that risk assessment piece where we look at where we identify those hazards that are potentially affecting the community and where those vulnerabilities are and where that risk overlap is. Uh, and then phase three is the mitigation strategy where we develop what we're going to do about it. And that's where we develop goals and objectives and specific actions or projects uh, that we're going to do to reduce risk within the county. Uh, and then phase four is the phase we're kind of in now. All those check marks is all stuff we've already accomplished. Uh, phase four is kind of the uh, uh, finalizing the plan, adopting it, and then keeping a plan current uh, so that we can create a, a safer and more resilient community going forward. So as this, we've been uh, made a lot of progress this we kicked off this project back in April and despite uh, pandemics and wildfires and everything else that 2020 has thrown at us, we've uh, managed to keep the project on schedule and made a, a, a ton of progress uh, since that first kickoff meeting in April. Uh, we had a, a second uh, planning team meeting in May that focused on that risk assessment piece. Uh, and then a third meeting in July, which focused on developing the mitigation strategy and those activities. Uh, I mentioned we did conduct a first public meeting uh, on May 28th. Uh, if you um, didn't attend that meeting and uh, you, you, you want to learn more, uh, in that meeting we went into a lot more detail on the specific hazards uh, than we're going to tonight. So if you're interested or if you know anybody else who might be interested, uh, you can watch a recording of that meeting on the uh, county's YouTube channel, uh, which is this link here, or you can just go to YouTube and search for Larimer County. Um, you have to scroll down a bit uh, to get down to May, but it's uh, it's there. So uh, you're welcome to, to watch that. And then we did conduct a uh, an online survey to get public opinion uh, on hazards. We're going to talk about that in a little second. And uh, we currently finished a, a draft a uh, first draft of the uh, the plan itself, which is being reviewed by the planning team and is going to be available for public comment here shortly. So I mentioned uh, the public survey we conducted. I want to go through the, the results of that. So we did have, uh, again, this was uh, survey was conducted online uh, from, uh, from May through July. We had both English and Spanish language versions available and we had 137 people respond to it. So if you were one of those 137 people, thank you very much. Uh, the input we got from this uh, survey really helps inform the uh, the planning process. So one of the first questions we asked is, you know, how many times in the last five years has a disaster or any kind of hazard event disrupted your life? And as you can see, only like 10% of the respondents said they hadn't had a, uh, had a hazard event impact them. Uh, for the vast majority of people uh, have experienced at least one, two, even as many as five or more uh, during just the last five years. So this confirms what we knew, which is that these events are um, pr frequent, and do happen often in Larimer County and, and throughout Colorado. Uh, we asked uh, the public, we asked you to rank uh, your perception of how important these hazards are. Uh, and as you can see, the, uh, the ones that ranked uh, the, the highest are uh, wildfire, spring and summer storm, uh, and, uh, win and severe winter storms. Uh, flooding also ranked very highly, as well as uh, biological hazards slash pandemic. Actually surprised that one didn't rank a little higher this year with everything going on. Uh, so we use this information to help inform, you know, we can crunch the uh, the numbers in terms of how many floods and how bad they've been and how much damage they've done. But it's also really important to understand the impacts to the people uh, who actually live in the community. So this uh, this information really helped the, the planning team evaluate uh, how important and how serious each of these hazards were. We also asked, uh, we listed some some possible different uh, mitigation actions or different activities that uh, the county and uh, different jurisdictions can do to reduce these risks. Uh, and we got uh, some uh, great suggestions here on on a wide variety of different of different um, um, activities that the governments should consider, uh, ranking from uh, wildfire fuels reduction and uh, forest health uh, watershed protection projects to uh, improving reliability of communications, public ed education awareness, participation in the National Flood Insurance Program, a really good broad um, swath of, of uh, possible activities, which again we did, um, the planning team then reviewed these when they started developing the list of actions. Uh, this helped inform uh, how they chose and prioritized those actions. And then we also asked, this just shows uh, where the respondents came from. Not surprisingly, the uh, more populated areas had more respondents, <laughs> but we also wanted to ask how long folks have lived in this community, because if we were mostly hearing from people who were really new to the to, um, to Larimer County, that might 
change how we look at the results, but the vast majority of the people responding here are uh, have, have lived here for for more for five years or more. Uh, so we know that we're getting a good uh, record of what's going on or what has happened in the county. So that was our uh, survey results. Next, what I'm going to do is walk you through the structure of the 2020 uh, Larimer County Hazard Mitigation Plan and kind of what, what it looks like and what's in the plan. As I mentioned, we're going to make this plan uh, available for public comments. This is consider this like an orientation to of what's in the plan and, and what you might find in there and where you might go looking for things. So uh, the plan's divided into uh, basically the uh, base plan of these seven sections and we'll go through each of these in detail on, on subsequent slides, um, but kind of those first seven sections discuss the community uh, or the county as a whole, and then we have a series of community annexes which go into detail for each of the participating jurisdictions, uh, and then a series of appendices which go into uh, a more detail and documentation and just have uh, a few more of the um, uh, bookkeeping type stuff um, out of the way. So going through each of these, uh, the first section one is the introduction, which kind of sets the stage for what's in the plan. It gives the context and why we're doing this and gives kind of a, just a couple of page uh, summary or overview of what's contained in the plan uh, for, uh, uh, for busy people who don't have time to read uh, the entire document. Section two goes into a community profile and basically gives an overview of, of the planning area. Uh, and this is, uh, partly for people who live in the community and partly for the, the make sure the planning team is on the, the, the same page as far as things, particularly things like demographics and uh, social vulnerabilities of people who might be more easily um, or might be more severely impacted by hazards. We also look at like things like future land use and development trends uh, and demographic shifts that might impact or that might change uh, the way hazards have affected uh, or that the, the might uh, change the way hazards impact the community in the future compared to how it's passed. And it's also served, of course, be, uh, serves, of course, to uh, introduce, or introduce people who aren't funny to kind of provide the context and the setting for what we're talking about. Section three goes over the planning process. It's a, a longer version of the, the slide I had a, a few slides ago that talks about everything we've done as part of this planning process uh, and what's changed since the 2016 plan, who all has been participating. Uh, and and a, a large part of this section is to document that we followed all the right steps uh, in order to in order to uh, get state and FEMA approval. But it also again is a record of, of who was actually at the table for these conversations. So section four is the biggest section of the plan by far. Uh, and this is the risk assessment or where we go into the uh, identifying the hazards that we're most concerned about that can affect Larimer County and quantifying uh, what those hazards can do and what the, those where those vulnerabilities are and what that risk air overlap looks like. Um, and this section is gonna, will in, includes a lot of, of mapping and analysis uh, for where we have data um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, again, this is a fairly uh, detailed section um, and very technical part of the plan that kind of talks about uh, what sort of wildfires uh, Larimer County has had in the past and can expect in the future. What are the probabilities of a tornado in the county and in what and how does that risk vary across the parts of the county? Uh, hazardous materials spills, where those are most likely to be and what's the most common uh, types of, of incidents that you have of those. Uh, we tried to go into uh, get as much detail as we can about uh, these different hazards. Section five looks at what capabilities the different different participating jurisdictions, uh, what, what we're already doing to reduce risk. There's a lot of things that are already being done, uh, ranging from things like uh, building codes and uh, floodplain regulations, uh, other plans that are in place like evacuation planning and so forth, uh, what uh, administrative and technical capabilities the jurisdictions have to kind of manage mitigation programs, what uh, uh, finan uh, um, financial uh, opportunities or different funding streams are available to help pay for mitigation. Uh, other programs and partnerships, I'm going to mention uh, the community rating system later. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, uh, storm ready program or firewise communities. Uh, other partnerships, uh, the uh, um, county uh, works very closely with the, the several watershed uh, partnerships which have been involved in this planning process. 
Uh, and then we also identified uh, any places where there might be uh, gaps that might be opportunities for uh, the jurisdictions to improve their capabilities to, to deal with uh, mitigation actions. Which then leads into section six, and this is really the so what are we going to do about it section. <laughs> so this is kind of the, the really the bottom line part of the plan, which is now that we've identified where the risk is, what are we going to do to reduce those? And it starts off with kind of the the the, the overarching goals and objectives of what do we as a, as a community want to focus on to reduce risk? Uh, what has been done? It's going to you know, documents a, a lot of progress that's been made since the last plan update. Um, and then we identified new plans to add to that. And basically what uh, the, the section concludes with is a list of actions that the uh, communities want to try and undertake uh, over, over the next five plus years to, uh, to reduce the risk from hazards in Larimer County. And then the last section in the, the regular plan is basically how, how, we, uh, how we're going to um, uh, implement this plan going forward. We want this to be a living document rather not just something that sits on the shelf for five years. So this, this section goes into uh, how, you know, how often it's, the plan is going to be reviewed, uh, monitored, how the effectiveness uh, of mitigation activities is going to be monitored and measured, how we're going to integrate mitigation planning into other plans and processes that the county already has going and then also how we're going to continue to keep the public involved throughout this process. So those seven previous sections uh, give an overview uh, across the entire county, but obviously Larimer County is a very large and very diverse county and the uh, the hazards and risks uh, in uh, Fort Collins are not the same as they are in Estes Park or in you know, the northern rural areas of the county. There's a lot of diversity across Larimer County. So uh, the uh, community annexes go into detail for each of these different communities on how, uh, the, how the risks for that county is, is different from the, uh, uh, from the county as a whole. So, you know, you, you might want to, when you uh, are reviewing your community, you might want to uh, focus on the annex for your community uh, and it'll refer you then back to the base plan if there's uh, for, for some general information, but it describes both uh, how the risk varies for each jurisdiction as well as uh, the specific mitigation actions that each jurisdiction uh, is going to be doing. So it's really a, a mini version of the uh, of the base document uh, for each of these community annexes. So that's the overall structure of the plan or the, the overall structure of the document. Next, I want to go into and uh, talk about a few key sections of the plan. Again, this is not, uh, th this is really just an overview and the idea here is to try and um, uh, whet your appetite and show you some things you, uh, where you might go find information in the plan. Uh, it's, this is a big document. This, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is like a thousand page document. So we're not expecting everyone to uh, review the entire thousand page plan, but uh, the, we're going to highlight a few key areas that you might find interesting or that you might want to go take a look at. So with that, uh, one of the things that we do look at is past disasters that have affected uh, the jurisdictions and sp um, uh, particularly in that one of the things we look at is um, is disasters that have been severe enough to require a federal disaster declaration. You can see there have been 26 that have affected Larimer County since the 50s, uh, which is a lot. That's the most of any county in Colorado, as a matter of fact. And you can see the different types, not quite half of them are by fire. Uh, flood is also a big one, and then several others to include the, the current uh, COVID pandemic. Um, everyone always wants to know, how did Larimer County get a coastal storm declaration? <laughs> That's actually from uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and they got a disaster dec declaration uh, for Colorado to uh, because we were assisting with uh, refugee evacuation from Katrina. So that's that's how that got in here. I mentioned the hazards that we're uh, looking at in the plan. So this is the the list of hazards and the rankings for them uh, that are in the plan. These rankings are kind of over for the county as a whole. Uh, each jurisdiction also ranked. Uh, the significance of each hazard for their specific jurisdiction because as we said we know that risk varies considerably across uh, the county uh, but you can see uh, it's a, a pretty diverse uh, and comprehensive range of different hazards we're looking at ranging from biological hazards which is things like a pandemics or other public health 
uh, public health um, threats, uh, civil disturbances. Dam inundation is new in 2020. Uh, we got some additional data. It was talked about briefly in the 2016 plan, uh, but the state has put together some uh, some uh, a better mapping and data on dam inundation. So uh, we uh, um, elaborated on that section on what would happen if there was an incident at one of the the dams uh, that affect uh, or could potentially affect Larimer County. Uh, drought was also something that was touched on in the previous plan, uh, but not in a, in a great deal of detail and the planning team felt very strongly that was something that we needed to look at more strongly. So we took a, a much deeper dive into drought this year. Um, earthquake is another one of those um, less likely uh, events, but if and when it does happen can be pretty, uh, pretty catastrophic. Flooding, of course, is something that, that uh, Larimer County is very familiar with. Uh, flooding includes both uh, riverine flooding, flash flooding, or urban flooding, uh, anything of that nature. Hazardous materials releases, of course, landslide and rock slide, uh, which mostly impacts the more rural areas, but, but also can impact urban areas. Soil hazards uh, includes things like uh, um, erosion and deposition, uh, land subsidence, compactive soils, collapsible soils, and expansive soils. There's this whole kind of range of, of, uh, of stuff that we've kind of lumped together under this category of soil hazards. Uh, severe spring and summer weather uh, to include tornadoes. Utility disruption is something that, that is traditionally not thought of as a hazard, but more of a the result of a hazard. You know, it's usually something you think of as that a storm comes through and knocks out the power. But, you know, as we're seeing more across the country, they can also happen just because we, you know, the grid's overloaded or something happened or a squirrel, you know, uh, chewed up the uh, um, uh, a line or something. So uh, the, the county's uh, elected to look at that as kind of its own set of hazards because it really does kind of have its own uh, utility. Power outages kind of have their own life to them. Uh, of course, wildfire is a, a, a major concern uh, throughout Larimer County uh, and then severe winter storms. And you can see across the top, we've uh, ranked each of these based on their frequency, which is how, how likely are do they occur and how often do they occur. The spatial extent, which is how big of an area is impacted by them. Uh, the severity, how bad is it? How, uh, how much damage are these things likely to do? And then based on that, given overall significance ranking. Uh, you can see most of these are higher medium significance. There's, there's not really a lot of low significance hazards because if something was low hazard, we didn't really want to waste a whole bunch of time on it. We want to focus this plan on the highest uh, the, the most uh, most severe hazards. So we've really focused this plan on those high and medium hazards. Uh, not listed on this list is climate change, uh, it, but it is something we very much talk about a lot in the plan. We didn't look at that as a separate hazard so much as we looked at what are its impacts going to be on each of these hazards. So every one of these hazards has a section in there that talks about uh, what the best science tells us for what we can, what we anticipate the impacts of climate change are going to be on these hazards and how that may change their frequency or their severity. So I mentioned a lot of the, uh, for, for the hazards where we can uh, map them, where they kind of have a geographically specific areas, uh, we've done so. This is just an example of one of the, the flood maps uh, from the flooding section. And you can see the uh, darker blue areas are the, uh, the areas that have been uh, identified as being at a 1% chance of flooding every year, sometimes referred to as the 100 year floodplain. And then the lighter blue areas are the 0.2% uh, the annual chance or, the, or sometimes called the 500 year floodplain. Uh, flooding is a good example of a, a sense where we have a we, we have a pretty good sense of where the flooding is most likely to happen and how how often it's going to happen. Um, although, you know, as uh, particularly those of you who live in, in urban areas can definitely testify when you get a lot of rain in, in, in an urban area, you can still get plenty of street flooding, whether or not you're in a floodplain per se. Um, but helping to identify these areas helps uh, these types of areas helps us identify uh, people and property at risk. Now, obviously, there's not a ton of detail on this countywide map, Larimer County being a, a covering a pretty broad area. So uh, for all of the jurisdictions or all the municipalities, we've gone in and also done uh, more detailed city maps. So here you can kind of see a little bit uh, a little bit closer of what areas are at risk, the different types of, there's actually several different variations within the 1% the chance floodplain. Uh, there's several different zones as FEMA categorizes them, which I, I won't go into today, but they're all explained in the plan. 
plan, as well as what different types of facilities uh, are, are located in each of these areas. I also want to point out uh, there's a number of area of the uh, orange areas are areas that are protected by levees, um, which again is fine as long as the, the levees are maintained and don't fail, uh, but it is uh, something you keep an eye on that, uh, that uh, that's a, a great way to remove areas from the floodplain, but it uh, there it is uh, some uh, risk is still associated with those areas. I mentioned before one of the things we look at in our analysis is um, people and property that are located in these at risk areas. So this is uh, an example table from the plan for uh, these are properties that are located in those uh, that 1% floodplain areas, the areas that have a 1% chance of flooding every year as mapped by FEMA. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see we've broken it down by jurisdictions uh, and different types of parcels, whether they're residential or commercial, and helps us count how many uh, parcels and buildings are located in those areas, what the uh, assessed or the, the assessor value of those properties are, and, and based on that, get an estimate of what the, the, the potential losses are if that area floods, how much, it would, how much damage would be done, as well as uh, estimates of how many people live in those impacted areas, so you know how many people are potentially at risk there. Uh, again, not going to go through this in detail, but just gives you an idea uh, of the types of analysis that's uh, conducted in the plan for those. Obviously, for something like drought, which is countywide, uh, it's, you know, we're not able to break it down at this level, but for uh, hazards that have a more specific spatial component, we try and do this analysis so we can help identify uh, how, how serious the risk is. Similarly, in addition to lo just looking at general property, we look at what critical facilities are located in hazard areas. So here again, as an example, is uh, this is critical facilities that are at in that 1% floodplain. And you can see it ranges from like things like electrical substations uh, or fire stations, police stations, uh, I, water, um, uh, water treatment sites, uh, identified uh, shelter sites, things of these nature, these categories come from uh, the different FEMA lifeline categories. Again, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, it's explained in the plan, but uh, identify what critical facilities are potentially at risk so that we can focus on protecting those properties. I mentioned uh, different capabilities and programs and so forth that the uh, different that the um, participating jurisdictions are already doing. A good example of that is the community rating system. Some of you may be already familiar with. Uh, this is a voluntary program run through the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, and basically for it rewards communities who have gone above and beyond uh, to protect their communities from flood damages. And it's basically is a long list of different activities that jurisdictions can do. And then based on, uh, on based on those activities and what they're doing, uh, every uh, participating jurisdictions are given a rating from 10, which is the lowest, to 1, uh, which is the highest. And the incentive for doing that is that based on those ratings, uh, they give a discount to if you live in that community and you have a flood insurance policy, uh, you will actually get a discount on your flood on your ins flood insurance rates uh, as a result of the county or the uh, jurisdiction participation in this program. Uh, you can see right now uh, cities of Fort Collins and Loveland uh, currently participate in, in the CRS program. In fact, uh, the city of Fort Collins has a CRS rating of two, uh, which is the second highest category. In fact, they are uh, one of the five or six, uh, the top five or six communities in the country. Uh, on in the CRS program, they are absolutely one of the the leaders nationally in the uh, the CRS program. And what and as you can see, the result from that is a 40% discount. If you live in Fort Collins and you have flood insurance, you are paying 40% less on your flood insurance uh, because of their participation in this program. And that translates to uh, $44,000 every year uh, that is that is uh, that is saved by flood insurance policyholders. Uh, Loveland is also in the program with a, a rating of six, which is also a, uh, also very good, uh, and that gets a 20% discount uh, on flood insurance policies. This is, uh, um, so we've looked at this for all the participating jurisdictions. There are some of the other jurisdictions that are considering uh, whether or not it makes sense for them to join. Uh, for a lot of the smaller jurisdictions, honestly, that don't have that many flood insurance policies, the uh, amount of, of work that it would take to get into the program doesn't really justify the, the, the relatively small savings they get out of it. But it is something some of the other uh, 
elections and uh, Larimer County as a whole is considering uh, maybe getting into the CRS program, which would then affect uh, uh, insurance rates in the unincorporated parts of the county. So uh, again, an example of a different program that the community already has in place uh, that as part of this uh, planning process, we've looked at ways we can uh, might be able to do better there. So moving into the mitigation strategy, uh, the uh, planning team identified uh, five goals that uh, th to uh, drive the countywide mitigation process moving forward. And these are basically very similar to the, the five goals in the uh, that were in the 2016 plan. We made a few uh, uh, minor verbiage changes here and there, but uh, overall the focus really hasn't changed uh, that much going back to the county's first mitigation plan in uh, 2010. Uh, it's had a very consistent uh, focus throughout all that, but you can see the. I'm not going to sit here and read all these to you, but you can see that you know protecting uh, lives and property, increasing community resilience, strengthening coordination and communication, uh, increasing public awareness, and then the last one I mentioned uh, in the uh, implementation uh, discussion is how do we do a better job of integrating mitigation into other mechanisms and other processes that the county has going on. Uh, in addition to the goals, uh, the, the participating jurisdictions agreed to five objectives, which are a little more, they're kind of, a, think of them as a step below goals. If goals are more uh, conceptual or uh, more um, what we're aiming for in kind of big picture stuff, objectives are a little more implementable and a little more, what are the specific things we're going to do to make those goals happen? So things like we're going to expand our public awareness program. We're going to have more training on hazard prevention mitigation. We're going to make sure that risk reduction is incorporated into other policy documents. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to collaborate with different partners with mutual aid agreements, and we're going to work to reduce the vulnerability of local assets. So again, this just kind of helps frame and focuses uh, the program. And all of that's kind of leading to developing actual mitigation activities. And these are the actual like specific projects that the jurisdictions are going to work on. Uh, and there's kind of, again, a, a wide range. We talked about, you saw the, uh, some of these we talked about uh, during the public survey uh, results earlier, but it can be anything from uh, plans and regulations, which could be adopting more, uh, more uh, newer and more stringent building codes or developing uh, or, or improving evacuation planning of that, things of that nature. Uh, could be a structural project like in, uh, in, uh, putting in a larger culvert or uh, flood proofing a house or elevating a house out of the floodplain or, you know, as in this middle picture here, uh, actually relocating, you know, just moving properties out of hazard areas and, and take, turning those hazard areas into more uh, natural areas or green space. Uh, public education and awareness we've already talked about. Uh, it's part of what this webinar is designed to do. And then as well as natural system stuff like, uh, you know, the classic example in Colorado is uh, uh, thinning out wildfire fuels. And there's a number of obviously different alternatives uh, kind of within those four categories, but uh, those are the kind of things that were considered by the planning, by the, the planning team and the jurisdictions. So this list shows, and I know this is a very busy slide. Uh, if this were an in-person presentation, this would be the point where I'd say, I know you can't read this in the back row, but uh, this just shows for each of the different jurisdictions, how many plans or how many mitigation actions. These are the specific projects that were listed in the 2016 plan. And then how many of them they've completed since then, along with how many new actions they've proposed uh, for this planning process. And then the last line is the total number of, of actions uh, in, the, uh, in the new plan. So there was uh, 169 total actions in the uh, uh, in the 2020 plan as uh, again a wide variety across all the different jurisdictions each jurisdiction did in, uh, include at least one new mitigation action and, and i want to point out if you're looking in this list if, if for your jurisdiction or your community and you're seeing a zero under the number of actions completed uh, please don't think that means they haven't been doing anything uh, it just means that you know the specific projects that were identified in 2016 were either long-term stuff that they haven't finished yet and they're still working on it or it may be something they haven't been able to get funding to help with yet, or in many cases, just other priorities came up. So while these are important and it's great to see so much progress being done on these, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the jurisdictions have done overall great work uh, in checking the box and getting a lot of these uh, actions completed. Uh, but 
many of these are long-term kind of annual implementation projects that are that are not easily wrapped up in just a couple of years. So if you see a zero here in that uh, completed actions column, that doesn't mean that that uh, uh, jurisdiction or district hasn't been doing anything. So. I mentioned the uh, the mitigation action plan. So as I said, this is that list of those 169 actions, and I just pulled out a couple here at random to kind of show you what those look like. Um, and for each action has to be tied to which specific goals and objectives it supports, uh, which specific hazard or hazards it's designed to mitigate against. Obviously, if we ha have a project that's going to reduce hazards from from more than or reduce risk from multiple hazards, that's uh, that's more cost effective and more efficient. So we like to do that. Identifies who uh, who's responsible for doing it, how much we think it's going to cost, and where that money is going to come from, as well as uh, how they prioritized it and what their timeline is to uh, to try and get this done. Uh, we know obviously can't do everything at once, so prioritizing these hazards is uh, was a really critical part of the planning process. Um, and then. Uh, the, uh, for each of these that are carried over from the 2016 plan and some of these even from uh, plans before that talks about uh, what's being done or what has been done so far and kind of what the current status on those is. Lastly, as, as I mentioned a couple of times, as we want this very much to be a, a living plan, not something that uh, just sits on a shelf in a three ring binder until the next plan update. So uh, the, the plan implementation and maintenance section talks about how we're going to make this plan happen and how we're going to keep it alive over the next five years to include how often the planning team is going to get back together and coordinate both on specific projects as well as um, meeting annually to look at the plan as a whole and are we making progress towards our mitigation goals? Are the prod are the projects that we are getting done? Are they uh, are they moving the needle? Are they making us uh, safer? Are they reducing uh, losses? Um, how are we? You know, what are the things that we're doing to integration in, integrate hazard mitigation and into other things like comprehensive plans and capital improvement planning processes and and so forth. Um, and then all the jurisdictions are committed to continuing to involve the public uh, over the coming years through. Um, public meetings and uh, fairs and so forth once we're allowed to, to have those sorts of things again, as well as pushing information out through websites and social media and those sorts of things. And then as discussed, this plan again will be updated uh, at least once every five years. All right, I know that was a lot of information and I went through it relatively quickly. The The idea here, you know, we, we don't really have time to go through a thousand page document in detail, uh, but I just kind of wanted to give an overview of the contents of the plan and give you a sense of what's in it um, so that um, you might want to go take a look at the plan and look at those specific areas that interest you. So the goal here was just kind of give you a sense of, of what's in there and what are the areas you might uh, one be interested in and uh, may have specific information to be uh, contribute to. So the next step in the process is public comments on the draft plan. As I said, we had um, there's kind of two stages to the public involvement process here, which is at the beginning of the process. You may notice we had that first public meeting where we're kind of uh, getting information about the hazards and similarly with the online public survey where we're kind of getting that information at the front of the planning process to help inform the development of the plan. And then now that we actually have a plan, uh, we want to get your feedback and your input on that plan as well. So that plan's going to be coming out shortly. We had had hoped to have it out in time for this meeting, uh, but between uh, the the wildfires and everything else going on, that got delayed a couple of weeks. So we're we're hoping we'll have that plan out uh, next week or or in the next two weeks certainly. So. Um, once that plan is available, uh, we'll, we'll make that plan available online and there'll also be a, an online uh, survey tool for you to give us your feedback uh, on the plan. Um, and uh, we'll, once that's available, we'll post that link on the, the different uh, uh, the county emergency management website as well as we'll put it out through Facebook and Twitter and all the usual social media feeds, not just for the county, but for all the participating uh, jurisdictions as well. Uh, basically, however you heard about the, today's meeting, uh, you'll, you should hear 
hear about the plan from that same uh, through that same mechanism. And then also, I believe if you're uh, on this public meeting today, uh, everyone who's joined, we've uh, we uh, have your email, and you'll get a, an email with the link to participate or to uh, provide uh, feedback on the plan once it's available. Again, we're hoping to have that out here next week. And when we do, again, we know that it's a really long document. We know that uh, 2020 is a crazy year, and everybody's really busy. Um, but if you do have time to look through this, if you've taken the time to, to sit through this um, uh, through this webinar, uh, we really uh, appreciate your interest and we really want your, your input and your feedback. It's uh, really easy for us here to sit and kind of write this plan with all this technical data in it, but if it doesn't match the lived experience of the people who actually live and work and, you know, and, and have lives in Larimer County, then that the plan is is not doing its job. So we very much want to, to you to help us kind of ground truth this plan. So again, we'll be sending out uh, that information here shortly as soon as it's available. Uh, once the uh, once we've gotten your feedback on the plan and incorporated that, then we'll, we'll incorporate that into a final draft plan, which will be then submitted to the state review, hoping to get that out either by the end of October or early November. Uh, and then uh, once the state has reviewed it, it goes to FEMA for approval. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, FEMA approval in December, maybe January with the holidays, and then in uh, hopefully in January, uh, the last phase of the process is that all the participating jurisdictions, everyone on that list will take it to their uh, their boards, their city council or their district board of directors or whatever uh, for formal adoption. And then it'll be the official plan for the next uh, five years going forward. All right, so thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to this. Like I said, I know that was a lot of information and I went through it quickly because I really want to get through to get to your questions uh, and feedback. So I'm going to stop talking and we're going to open it up for uh, participation, questions and comments from the public. Thank you again. All right, folks, I'm going to have my panelists I'm back. I see Shale there. And there's Scott. All right. So we do have a question. So yay. Um, I get excited when we get questions. Um, and it's okay if you don't have questions. We're, we're happy that you're here just, just to learn more. But let's start out, if you guys are okay, starting with our question. You ready? Good. Sure. Okay. Um, Vicki asked, did not see Bellevue on the mitigation actions and my second home is in danger right now if it is still there tomorrow. I will be in the clear. USFS does not mitigate, we did. And we have reported about human caused hazards to the county, but they won't even come up and inspect unless we sign our name to an open document. I'm sorry to hear about your house being in danger right now, Vicki. I know this is very stressful for you. So um, thanks for joining us tonight, considering all that's going on. But Shale or Scott, can you help me answer that question? Yeah, so this is Shale with Emergency Management for Larimer County. So Bellevue is actually considered under part of um, Poudre Canyon Fire, Fire District. Um, it's under their um, actions. So I think the table that Scott showed is just showing kind of an overview of these are all the jurisdictions that are involved. Um, and, and when you see the full draft of the plan, it'll have everybody's actions laid out. But I can say that um, looking at opportunities in which to collaborate with the Forest Service, with organizations like the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed, other types of partners that are involved with um, forest mitigation, forest restoration work is an action that's been included with all of our um, volunteer fire departments um, because you might be familiar with this Vicki but um, government agencies can't do mitigation on private land. Um, you can't use taxpayer dollars for private gain. Um, so we're really lucky here in Larimer County to have organizations like the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed that is looking at opportunities in which we can work together in the nonprofit, private, or nonprofit and public sectors to come together to be able to identify projects in which we can do more work on private land. Um, sorry, my cat <laughs> just jumped down in the background there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that kind of gets to what your question is asking, um, but uh, hopefully there'll be more opportunities in the future where we can come together to address um, fire concerns. 
I don't know if Scott had anything he wanted to add to that. I was going to say, and, and Vicki had something to add, and I'm not sure if this actually changes your answer at all. Um, so she wanted to know, let you know her part of Bellevue is under RCFD. I don't risk Canyon Fire Department, okay. I guess. Um, and then she says, but USFF, USFS butts up to private lands, and the hazards I'm talking about are chemical. So I'm not sure if that changes any answers or if that's something new to address, but. So I, I'd be curious, Vicki, to hear what chemical hazards you're referring to. I'm not familiar with that. The the kind of broad answer is show forth. Uh, so all of the uh, the municipalities and most of the, uh, the, the fire districts uh, participated in the plan as participating jurisdictions and, and yeah I'm using the air quotes there because that's a, a FEMA term uh, and there are requirements for participation and so forth. So um, the uh, unincorporated uh, areas like Bellevue are very much included in the plan. Uh, you're basically covered under the base plan under the unincorporated part of the county uh, and again uh, under the, the fire districts. Private landowner burying chemicals. Um, Shale, I'll let you take that one. Um, so it's, it's like a neighbor that's burying chemicals, I'm assuming? That would be my guess, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do, we do have what is called the, and maybe I'm just not the good person to answer chemical related questions, um, but we do have what is called the um, LEPC, which is the Larimer Emergency Planning Committee, I think is what that stands for. Um, and they're the ones that look at different things like uh, chemical use in the county and whatnot. I'm not sure how that works when it's a private person, but we can definitely follow up and try to find an answer for you. And we'll, we'll have our contact information at the end of this. Michelle will email it out. So if you want to um, tell me more about what's going on in that situation is probably really good for us to be aware of as well as the fire departments. Um, so please follow up with an email on that and uh, we will talk more about what's going on there because that does sound like kind of a um, unique situation. Yeah, and uh, I think I mentioned before hazardous materials is something that's uh, addressed in the plan. Uh, looking more at like, you know, large uh, companies and, and uh, treatment plants and so forth. Uh, but definitely something that uh, can be addressed, so. So yeah, just to reinforce, um, Vicki, since you had your, um, looks like she might've fallen off the call, but if, if she didn't, um, I have everyone's email address so I can um, get that in, into Shale and Scott and they can follow up for y'all. Any other questions from the group? Don't forget the, the folks that have called in, you can press star nine if you wanna raise your hand. Um, We'll pause here for just a second to see if anybody raises their hand or uses the question and answer to ask any more questions. While people are thinking this might be the time for Shale and Scott to add anything that maybe you didn't get to add earlier. Just uh, again, a reminder, and we'll put that link up here. In fact, let me, uh, I think I, can I put that I can't put stuff in the chat, right? But can we um, put that you, link for the survey? I guess actually, you can use, since you're a panelist, Scott, you can okay. use the chat and send it out to all panelists and attendees. Do you have that option on your chat? Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna, so I'll, we'll put that, um, oh, we, we don't have the link for the, uh, uh, sorry, we don't have the, the, the link for the, the draft plan yet because it's not available yet but uh, like you said we will be uh, be sending that out here um, like Sam we're hoping to get it out next week um, but uh, certainly next week or two you'll have a, a, a draft for that uh, to look at and encourage everyone to uh, take some time and take a look at that like I said don't expect you to read the whole thing but take a look at the parts that uh, you have an interest in or have experience in uh, and that you think you have something to contribute on. Awesome. Shale, do you have anything you want to close on? Or Amy, I should say too. Um, I don't I don't have anything really to add. I just want to say thank you to everybody who took the time to be part of this webinar. Um, I know that there's so much going on, believe me, <laughs> as somebody working in emergency management right now, I totally understand the craziness of everything that's going on in the world. I know that a lot of people are being impacted by hazards as we speak. Um, and so for you all to take the time to share 
your time with us um, means a lot to us. And, and we really appreciate your feedback in this whole process and making sure we have a plan that is effective because as Scott says, we don't want this to just be something that sits on a shelf. Um, it's not a another typical government plan. This is an actionable plan and we actually want to um, do something about the issues we have in our community. So thank you all. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Shale. Amy, any last words you want to add? I would just reiterate what Shale said. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, there's a lot going on right now. So thank you for taking the time out of the day to join us. Thank you, Amy. And thanks, Scott and Shale. And with that, I don't see any other questions. So just a reminder, we will post this on Lamar County's YouTube channel. Um, probably you just need to search for mitigation. We don't have too much on our, on our channel that, that has mitigation in the title. So you should be able to find this one um, as well as the one we did back in May-ish in May time. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and close us out. And Shale, you can let your cat out now because I saw she wanted out. So good night, everybody. We hope to see you soon. Thank you all.